I'm here in uh, Berlin at the HKW for the meeting of the Anthropocene curriculum or the Anthropocene campus as they call it. It's a very interesting uh, nine-day project uh, to explore how different people interpret, use, and so on the concept of the Anthropocene. So I'm here as one of the instructors for one of the so-called triads. There are nine of these. Each of us, each of these uh, groups have three or four instructors and about 40 or 50 uh, participants and we examine a different aspect of the concept of the term, of the idea of the Anthropocene. Some people look at how it is interpreted in media, other people look at uh, how it's modeled in terms of mathematical models. The group I'm involved with uh, is a group called Filtering the Anthropocene. And by filtering we mean how do people come with preconceived notions, whether it's due to their belief systems, their political beliefs, religious background, educational level, and so on. Uh, and this, uh, in a way, filters how they interpret or use the term Anthropocene. So we're going to look at some, some case studies, a couple of case studies. We'll look at the case of Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans in the US uh, some years ago now, uh, but how different people uh, filtered that experience, their response, and so on, depending on where they sat in society what their beliefs are. In other words, looking at this as a type of extreme weather event, which will become more common, is already becoming more common in the Anthropocene. Uh, how are people filtering those sort of events uh, using their belief systems? The second one we'll look at is uh, going to a different part of the world, going to India, and looking at the case of where large dams are constructed uh, to produce large amounts of hydroelectric uh, power. Now this is, from an anthropocentric, uh, Anthropocene point of view, a very good thing to do because you're producing energy with little or no carbon emissions. But then there are the, the more local human dimensions associated with that. Often these large dams flood very large areas, they flood villages, uh, they destroy people's livelihoods, they, uh, people have to move and, and, and look for new, uh, new ways of working, new places to live and so on. So their filtering of the Anthropocene would be very, very different from a construction worker's filtering, which would be very different perhaps from a climate change scientist filtering of it, saying this is a good thing because it may be replacing a coal-fired power station. So we're looking at this broad um, issue of how people filter, how they use their own belief systems, their predisposed notions about the world, how it works, how it should work, and how they apply that uh, to a concept like the Anthropocene. Well, one of the aspects of the Anthropocene curriculum and, of course, our seminar in is you have to produce something uh, at the end of it. Uh, so we have an idea, a uh, rather innovative idea, that rather than produce a book chapter or something rather academic, we want our students to look at these two case studies I was talking about, Hurricane Katrina in um, New Orleans, a big dam somewhere in India, and turn this into some sort of artistic product. It could be a book, a novel, or I should say an outline or a, a storyline for a book or a novel. It could be something on YouTube. Uh, it could be a TV series, maybe a reality show uh, working with villagers in the path of this, this big dam. Uh, or it could be a movie. So, so the students have been asked to look at various types of novels or movies that have already been done on aspects of the Anthropocene as sort of examples of how people have used these artistic modes rather than an academic book to express their views on the Anthropocene. So we're asking them to do that as, as a homework before they come here to Berlin. But then after they do this sort of more academic um, analysis of these case studies, we want them to say, all right, we want you to communicate this to a general public, not an expert audience or an academic audience, and we want you to use one of these artistic mediums, whether it's a, a novel or whether it's a TV series or whether it's a YouTube or whether it's a, a very interactive web 
display, whatever it is, and we want them to use their creativity. So at the end of this, um, we hope to continue to work with HKW here, who's going to curate a website on the basis of this nine days of the Anthropocene curriculum, and see if we can get the very best uh, of these ideas and carry them forward at the end of our day and a half of seminar and, and, and make a really nice but very innovative and unusual product out of it. Well, I think when you look at the new IPCC report, and it is structured in the usual IPCC way of three working groups, and you look at working group one, which is the scientific physical basis uh, for understanding climate change, uh, I think the, the big story there is uh, we're more certain than ever. There's absolutely no doubt what's, whatsoever what's happening to the climate system. Uh, the climate system is warming. Uh, we now see influence of, the cli of, of a changing climate on extreme weather events like heat waves uh, in my country, like bushfires, uh, like extreme rainfall events, and coastal flooding events uh, that are exacerbated by sea level rise. So we have much stronger evidence now than we did in the previous report uh, that these uh, extreme weather events, which occur naturally, of course, are now being influenced uh, by the fact that we have a warmer, a more energetic climate. I think the projections for the future are now more secure. In fact, if you look at sea level rise, it's now projected a little bit higher than it was in the previous report, uh, and so on. So in a way, the physical science basis is just ever stronger as you go through these IPCC reports. I think working group two was interesting because it, it, it said, I think for the first time, that it's now clear that we can see the impacts of climate change on every continent and across all the oceans. So this is the first time that the IPCC, I think, has said at such a broad scale, the impacts of climate change are already with us now. It's not something for the future. It's not something that happens when we hit two degrees or past two degrees. It's already happening, uh, and we're not quite at one degree of global average surface temperature rise. So those two parts of the puzzle have, have solidified uh, compared to earlier IPCC reports. I think what the Working Group 3 report tells us is that we've made dramatic increases in our ability to deal with climate change uh, in terms of the mitigation side of things in particular. Uh, the cost of renewable energy systems like wind energy, solar energy has dropped remarkably over the past three or four years. Uh, we're making uh, gains on story, energy storage systems. There are ways to go there, uh, but we're on track to, to getting there. Um, when you look at transport systems, um, we're starting to now look at electrified ground transport systems, uh, a resurgence of rail, electrified rail, particularly in urban areas. Um, there's progress being made on electric vehicles. Um, so I think when you put this whole picture together, when you put the working group one, the working group two, the working group three, for the first time, I think, there is a complete, clear narrative on climate change. And the narrative is really simple. This is a real phenomenon. It's occurring. We understand the science really, really well. There is no debate. There hasn't been for two decades. Second, there are very high risks to our well-being, our economic well-being, our health and our personal well-being, uh, our ability to grow food, the ecosystems on which we depend, and we understand these risks better. These risks look more severe at lower levels of warming than we thought before. So we understand the science, we understand the risks, but now we have the solutions. F I think far more clearly than ever, bef ever before, we can see that it is feasible to transform economies to lower no carbon energy systems. It is feasible to build buildings uh, that use much, much less energy than they did in the past. We can electrify ground transport. In the longer term, we can, tr we can find alternative fuels for aviation and so on. The solutions to this are much more in our grasp now than they were even three or four years ago. So the entire narrative is coming together. The bottleneck now is political. It's in, it's in people's perceptions, it's invested interests, it's in conservative governments who refuse to acknowledge that not only is there a problem, but we understand how to solve it. I think there's momentum building for solving it. We have just very recently seen, uh, I think, an historic agreement between the USA and China that goes much further than they have before uh, in pledging to reduce their emissions, and they are the world's two biggest emitters. The EU has already been out ahead, so now we have three major groups, the EU, the USA, and China, are, are moving much more vigorously. And I think the reason they're doing that 
is they can see this narrative that I can just describe. They can see the risks. They can feel the risks in their own cities as, uh, and in their own countrysides um, as you have uh, more severe droughts, as you have more heat, heat waves and so on. But importantly, they can start to see the solutions. They can start to see the that the solutions are economically viable and technologically viable. So now I think the big constraint is not the whole picture of climate change, the problem and the solution, it's the vested interest, it's the power blocks, um, mainly in the fossil fuel industry, who are now in a blocking move to block progress on, on climate change. Well, one of the most important outcomes, as I mentioned in the IPCC Working Group 2 report, are that the impacts of climate change are with us now. They're not something for the future. And that means we have to deal with these. Uh, and the term that's commonly used in, in the climate science community is adaptation. Adaptation means taking measures to cope with the impacts of climate change, or in some cases of actually grabbing opportunities and benefiting. Uh, an example of that might be in, in northern areas where agricultural areas today are limited by cold temperatures, and as the planet warms it may open up uh, opportunities for longer growing seasons or moving agricultural areas further north. So that is a form of adaptation. But by and large, the impacts we see even now are generally negative. They're things that decrease agricultural production, things that impact on human health, uh, endanger natural ecosystems, cause damage to infrastructure. That means to minimize these, we have to adapt. We have to take actions. What are some actions? Well, for example, in heat waves, the people who are usually most vulnerable to heat are the very young or importantly, the very old people. And when we see heat waves in Europe in 2003, in Melbourne and Australia 2009, it's mainly these people who suffer. So what can we do to adapt? Well, we can develop better early warning systems because we can see these coming now days in advance and we can warn people. We can have better systems for getting messages out to isolated uh, elderly people uh, in urban areas, for example. We can identify havens uh, air-conditioned shopping malls or other large buildings which are air-conditioned which people can go to if they don't have adequate uh, air conditioning in their own dwellings. And we can develop transport systems, volunteers and so on to get these people from their vulnerable positions into somewhere where they're safer. These are ways of adaptation. Well what do you do in, in agriculture? Well you can start developing different crops that are more resistant to drought or to heat. You can change the planting dates uh, you may need to irrigate a bit more if you're having more droughts. These are all techniques which agriculture knows, uh, but may have to be applied more and more. Now, there is something a bit dangerous about this idea of adaptation because some people who would rather not do anything about mitigation say, well, let's just adapt to it. We'll just cope with it. We'll learn to live with it. We'll adapt and everything will be all right. This puts you in a very dangerous position because if it uh, retards or delays effective mitigation, you are building up further and more serious changes in the climate system. And you may well get to situations where you cannot adapt, where the impacts will simply overwhelm the system, whether it's a health system or an agricultural system or so on. Then you've got a double whammy. You can't adapt and you've let the climate system get out of control so it's almost impossible to mitigate it. So one of the points we keep making as climate scientists is this isn't the case of, oh well, let's adapt so we can take the pedal off the effort to mitigate you actually have to do both, and you have to do both vigorously. Uh, there's a nice little saying that some scientists use now, and that is you have to adapt to the unavoidable, but you have to avoid the unadaptable, which means you have to do both. Uh, and so that's, uh, that really comes into play, I think, when you look at some of the longer-term climate uh, impacts. Uh, and a good example of that is sea level rise. People look at sea level rise and they say, well, it's only rising three millimeters a year, well that's not very much, surely we can easily adapt to that. But what they forget of course is that that leads to a much larger increase in coastal flooding. So for every approximately 10 centimeters of sea level rise, which isn't that much, it only looks about like that, you get a trebling of coastal flooding events on average, it varies from place to place. So again, what are you going to do about that? Well, here's a case where mitigation is important because there is so much momentum in the ocean uh, and in the ice sheets, which are the two major factors that play into sea level rise. That if we don't start mitigating ever more vigorously, we will be committed 
to sea level rise. We already are to a certain level for centuries. Uh, and if we don't get mitigation going much more vigorously and effectively, we're going to be looking at meters of sea level rise in the coming centuries. Uh, and of course, slowing that will really help us adapt. Getting the, the emissions under control and eventually stabilized will help us in, in the future stabilize sea level rise. This could be an extremely, extremely costly impact. So what I'm talking about when I said we need to avoid the unadaptable, there are some estimates that the economic cost of coastal flooding later this century, by the 2070s or 2080s, if we keep going on this upper emission scenario, could cost the world three to four to five percent per year of GDP. That's more than GDP growth. That's a collapse scenario. It's an economic collapse. That is uh, something you can't adapt to. So again, this is what I say is, of course you have to adapt. We have to adapt now. We may have to build seawalls. We may have to have urban planning that moves future inf infrastructure back from the coastline. But if we just say, all right, we'll do that and not mitigate, we'll get into a position where we can't adapt. And we may very well collapse. So adaptation is important. It's essential. We have to do it. But we cannot take the emphasis off mitigation. It's both and rather than either or. Now, one of the issues that people talked about in adaptation is, well, can you just do things that you know how to do anyway and do more of them, sometimes called incremental adaptation? Yes, you can. Agriculture is a, a good example of that, uh, where if you have a, a system now uh, which may be a little bit subject to heat stress at some point in the growing season, you can simply adjust the sowing date of your crop and put it into a little cooler uh, uh, part of the year before it gets really hot. You can irrigate if, if drought is becoming more of a problem and so on. But you may get to a point where you need to transform a system. In other words, completely change it. Now, the way to understand how that operates and when you need to do it is to use a decision-based uh, framework for ad adapting. You look at the normal decision framework you use for your enterprise, whether it's agriculture, whether it's a business, uh, whether it's a health system or whatever, and look at how climate affects it now and look at where your decision points are. And then you say, well, as climate is shifting and we know something about the directions it's shifting, then you can see in your decision framework where and when you need to change. But if you do that, there may be some point where you say, well, the climate changes that are coming are overwhelming the system as I know it now, and I may have to transform that system, uh, make it into something quite different. Uh, as I said before, the best way to do that is to use a decision-oriented uh, framework for looking at adaptation. Well, one of the issues you have with adaptation, particularly when it comes to transformation, is getting the social license or the, or the approval of society to take steps now that will pay off 30 or 40, 50 years uh, in the future. I'll give you a couple of examples. Uh, let's say uh, in my home city of Canberra in Australia that we need to replace some street trees. So we have a lot of trees. It's a beautiful city, a lot of parklands. People value their trees. But as trees die or if we have uh, an extreme event, a, a big windstorm and blow some down, and we need to replace them, we need to think carefully because trees are long-lived biological infrastructure. They can live for decades or even centuries. And we know the climate's going to be different. In Canberra, it's going to be warmer, considerably warmer, and odds are it'll probably be drier. So smart planners will say, aha, we need to plant different, tre plant different trees because the ones that people like now aren't going to be viable 30 years in the future. And when they try to do that, people who live on these streets scream up and down saying, no, we love these trees. We want to have these trees. Uh, and so now there's a big problem and you have to explain, well, this tree might be all right for 10 years, but it has an 80 year lifetime and it won't survive much longer because it's going to be too hot. Uh, and then people get very upset because they don't believe it. They don't believe it'll get that hot that fast or, or, or so on. Another example is in coastal communities. People love uh, living near the coast in many parts of the world. That's really true in, in Australia. And they value properties that are on the coast, that have beachfront property that look out over the ocean. Now again, this is a long-term issue. When you buy property down the coast and you want to retire there or you want to pass it on to your kids, you want this property to be viable for 50 years or even longer. And we know in, in the most vulnerable areas of coastline, that's going to be changed in 50 years. There'll be beach erosion, be increased flooding. Uh, and when you have a property there, you'll see it value, its value drop very quickly. So town and regional planners understand this. 
they know it's going to be an issue, and they want to change zoning laws so that they can account for this so people don't build on property that will become unviable, will get flooded, will get eroded in 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years because oftentimes then people try to sue the local council because they allowed the building in the first place. So councils have a legal obligation and a planning obligation to actually change the planning laws to move those properties back. But that creates an enormous conflict with developers and individual property owners who see value now and want to sell property now and want to make money now and want to have beachfront property now and into the future. So there's a huge conflict going on in many coastal communities around Australia. So even when you understand transformation and the need for it, even when you understand the science, and we know for certain that sea level is rising, there's no doubt about that, we know for certain the earth is getting hotter, these things are not in doubt. But still, getting the social license to make those changes can be extremely difficult. In fact, oftentimes, it's that sort of constraint which is the major constraint. It's not an understanding of the science. In fact, it's not a willingness of the appropriate authority to act. They understand, and they understand why they need to act. But to get society to come along in complex issues that have very long time frames is a very difficult thing to do. Yeah, the issue of, of, of what adaptation means for society is an interesting one. Uh, because uh, people get, do get concerned about it uh, when it starts affecting culture and starts changing uh, culture. The examples I like to give when people ask me about what, what are the cultural changes uh, have to do with sports. And they ask me why sport. Sport is a universally important part of virtually every culture in the world. And I'll give you some examples of where cultures are already affected by climate change uh, and how uh, it's actually disturbing uh, a lot of people because uh, their sporting activities are so embedded in their culture that they have to change. First example comes from the far north, comes from Sweden, uh, where there's a sport called bandy hockey, which is an outdoor form of ice hockey played on much bigger rinks. Uh, and because it's outdoors, of course, you need a certain low temperature uh, for the ice to form uh, and be solid enough for them to play ice hockey on. And normally the Swedish uh, bandy hockey season starts in November, usually around mid to late November. Uh, but now, in several seasons, they've had to delay the start of the season for quite a while because it's been too warm and they can't keep the ice down on the rinks. Uh, it just gets too soft, skaters can't skate and they can't play. And people get really annoyed uh, because this really uh, bites into their, their cultural life. Second example comes from Australia, my country, where one of our most popular sports is rugby. Uh, at least in many parts of the country. Certainly where I live, rugby is a big sport. And it's not just for the, the Wallabies, the national team. It's for local teams, for, for schoolboys playing it, uh, for uh, local teams playing it. Well, a few years ago, we had an extremely severe drought that lasted for, for several years. And in some of the neighboring towns to Canberra, they were virtually running out of water. Now, what does that have to do with rugby? Well, it doesn't have to do with rugby players drinking water. It has to do with the fact that they have to play on a grassy pitch. Uh, and if it gets too dry, those pitches cannot be watered. They become very hard, and when they play rugby, people get broken bones, cracked skulls, all sorts of things. They cannot play. It wipes out a rugby season. Well, we tried to solve that by adaptation. And what was the adaptation? Well, for the communities around Canberra, the fact that Canberra has large water storage has meant that Canberra could continue to water some of its ovals or pitches, and the surrounding towns had to bring their rugby into Canberra. It was a huge nuisance, people complained, but the alternative was unacceptably high injuries. This is a result of climate change, big cultural impact. The third is uh, a sport uh, called mountaineering, uh, climbing in the Alps of Europe, climbing in the Himalaya. Uh, and there we see that this is not just a nuisance, it's a real danger. Uh, because as the climate warms, um, snow and ice, which was formerly solid, is now becoming unstable. It avalanches, it slides down in unpredictable ways, and it can endanger the lives of, of climbers. We had a good example of that this year in the Himalaya. Uh, and if you look at Mount Everest, which of course is a very popular mountain uh, for people to attempt to climb because it's the world's highest, uh, the standard route uh, goes through a fairly dangerous icefall and up onto a place called the South Col and then to the summit. Now, to climb that, almost everyone now relies on Sherpas, local people who live up on the high mountains who are very skilled, and they have to put ropes through these dangerous areas so that the western climbers can get, get up fast and safely. This year, 18 Sherpas were killed uh, in that area. 
not by the normal problem of instability of the icefall, but by a huge shelf much higher up on the mountain, which had been stable for years, uh, was destabilized because it's warming, and a huge avalanche came down. If you go up to the uh, last camp before you get to the very summit of Mount Everest, that's 8,000 meters high. That's really high. Over the last few seasons, for the first time ever, they're seeing liquid water. Formerly, it was always frozen there. So what we're seeing is even in the highest mountains in the world, we're seeing warming creeping way up to very high levels. This is destabilizing previously stable ice formations on those mountains and endangering climbers uh, and other people who go up into the mountains. So these are three examples of where climate change is having cultural impacts on people, forcing people to change. Uh, and, uh, and I found in my experience it's actually these sorts of things that really get people annoyed. Uh, because things like sport are very popular uh, in life. But it's a general principle here that, that changes to our weather patterns, changes to extreme events, really do affect culture. Another example in Australia, because we're becoming more fire prone, we're, here, we're getting more high fire danger weather, people are going out less and less and walking in the bush because it's becoming more and more dangerous. Again, it's a cultural shift that's being forced on people because the climate is changing. Well, I think one of the most interesting um, aspects of being a climate scientist these days is you, in a way, can't avoid uh, getting involved in some of these big societal issues, uh, discussions about transformation, about change, about mitigation of climate change, and ultimately, of course, what society needs to do uh, to transform or to mitigate or whatever. And of course, that gets you into policy areas, into political areas, and so on. The way I like to look at it is, is that we have an obligation as scientists to make sure the most authoritative, credible, accurate information is there. And we don't just communicate it, we engage people in a more two-way conversation about it. Uh, and that's people, uh, people uh, out there in, in all walks of life. It's political leaders, it's business leaders, uh, and so on. Uh, one thing that most of us try not to do is prescribe what policies ought to be. Uh, that's something for a broader discussion because it involves e economic issues, social issues, equity issues, cultural issues. But scientific issues need to be part of that mix. Uh, and there I think what we need to do is to ensure that all levels of society under understand one thing really clearly, that the future cannot be a continuation of the way we operate now. If you ignore climate change, you're going to get to these unavoidable impacts that are going to sweep over society anyway change it completely. The options of society are to let that come with really nasty consequences in terms of how people have to cope with it, or to transform, both in terms of adaptation, but particularly in terms of mitigation, transform energy systems and so on. The science is really clear on that point. That's not a political point. It's a scientific fact. So I think it's very important for us to make that really clearly that if you don't want to make the mitigation changes, if you don't want to transform to renewable and other low carbon energy technologies, the world will not go on like you think it will. You will get even more drastic change and that change will be out of your control. Now that's well understood scientifically. So we don't prescribe what policies need to be done to deal with this big dilemma, but what we're saying is you cannot avoid the dilemma. You have to do something. So this is what we're putting forward. And then, hopefully, if people accept this, we can have a rational discussion of all the different factors, the, the social factors, the economic factors, the technological factors that come into actually doing something about it. But I think we scientists actually have a role not only to put the dry facts of the science out, but to make really clear what the implications of the science really are.